Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good whatever it is, wherever you are, and welcome to the SNEA NSF, that's the Networking Storage Forum, presentation on Smart Next to XPUs. Why is the use of accelerators accelerating? If you don't know what an XPU is, join the club, neither do I. Let's find out today together. So I'm joined today by, I'm Alex McDonald, by the way, and I'm an independent consultant, by, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Joe White, who's a fellow at Dell Technologies. Hey, so good morning for you, Joe. Yeah, it's uh, still morning for me. How are you doing, Alex? I'm fine. I'm also joined by Jay Menon, who's chief scientist at the entertainingly named Fungible. Hi, Jay. Hi, good morning. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, Leah Kamosh, who's the CTO at New Reality. Hi, Leah. Hi, Alex. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm fine. And last but never least, John Kim, who is the SNEA NSF chair and works for NVIDIA. Hi, John. Hello, Alex. So before we start today's presentation, just a few housekeeping things. Before I talk about SNEA, I'd like you to note on the interface that you have in front of you that you can ask questions during this presentation. We may not have time to get to all of them during the presentation, uh, but if we do, um, we'll, we'll answer them as and when. The questions will also be answered on a blog, and you'll get a link to that at the back end of the presentation. The presentation itself is on the attachments. You can download it right now and follow along on the slides if you wish to look at them out of real time. And last but not least, if you could rate us on exit, uh, where one is, oh, that was terrible, all the way up to five, which was, we really need more of this stuff. So rating at the back end and any comments you might have would be gratefully appreciated. Just very quickly, sneer at a glance, we're 180 industry-leading organizations. There are about 2,500 active contributing members that we have and 50,000 IT end users and storage pros worldwide who consume our material. That's you. You can learn more at sneer.org slash technical. We've also got, as you can see, a Twitter handle, a nice short one, at sneer. The networking storage forum itself covers some specific uh, uh, technologies, uh, things like Ethernet, Fiber Channel, InfiniBand, uh, software stacks like iSCSI and NFS and NVMe over fabrics, virtualized HCI, storage protocols like block file and object, and the security of data. So we cover a quite a wide range, but the emphasis on networking. Today, we're going to deviate slightly. We're actually taking the opportunity to talk about something completely new in terms of XPU. So we're going to add that to the list of things that we do. In terms of the presentation itself, Here's the legal mumbo jumbo. Uh, basically, if this presentation, you want to use it, please read the attached slide here and work out whether you can employ a lawyer if need be. I'm not one, neither are you. Let's get one involved. So the agenda today, really quickly, we're going to be talking about what is an XPU. Most of us, I suspect, will have heard of CPUs uh, and perhaps GPUs, but this is an extension that that takes us well beyond uh, traditional compute environments. We're going to talk about XPU trends and workloads, talk about deployment and solutions, and lastly, the market landscape. So the stuff that we're talking about here today is real. This is not a figment of a marketeer's imagination. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Joe White to take us away. Joe, over to you. Hey, thanks, Alex. So what we thought we should start with is a little bit about XPU terminology and taxonomy and how that relates to the taxonomy of things that are already well defined. Um, the terminology has evolved quite a bit over time, uh, starting with um, smart NICs and intelligent NIC has also been used in the past. Uh, it's picked up DPU, data processing unit, IPU, infrastructure processing unit, FAC, function accelerator card and NAPU, network attached processing unit. These are what we're calling XPUs now. And we have a new thing to define here. And the question mark is supposed to be a nice smiley face. Uh, I don't know why it rendered as a question mark, but you know, the, the point here is that there's a class of device, which I'm going to define the elements of define where it sits in the system and tell you more or less what it's good for. 
And then my colleagues are going to dig into the various aspects of the XPUs and more details on the, the overview I set forward. And we want to contrast these XPUs to other kinds of processing units, which are have broad classifications as uh, neural tensor and graphics processing units, right? And these are good for vector matrix tensor uh, acceleration. CPUs, which we know and love for you know a very large number of years, which are good for general purpose compute and you know small versions for real time and so on. And then there's another use of NPU, which is network processing units. So these are your you know your favorite uh, switch chips that do network uh, packet uh, forwarding. Um, and then finally, there's a, a application processing unit, which combines GPU and CPU, but there's a whole set of tightly coupled combinations that are being talked about that combine the various other processing unit functions together on single cards. And the taxonomy would get really interesting at that point. So for now, we're going to say these are the broad classifications and terminology. So let's look at what an XPU itself really is. All right. Um, the way I like to describe this is it's effectively a microserver that's optimized for data flow and packet processing. It provides accelerators, offload engines, and the ability to host local services. It's typically a component uh, that's hosted in the system, as you can see on the upper right. So it would sit inside of a, a server um, and um, has access to other local devices, has access to the CPU and DRAM, and it can serve the function of a standard NIC. It can serve the uh, functions of, uh, um, uh, say, a local uh, RAID controller. It could pretend to be a GPU. It could pretend to be a local NVMe device. Because it's got a lot of processing capabilities and virtualization capabilities, it can pretend to be a lot of things all in parallel, all right? And so what does an XPU consist of at its heart? It's, it consists of cores. And again, four to 32 is just kind of the current uh, public roadmap ranges. You know, it, there could be um, other architectures that have uh, many more cores on them. Uh, it has local DRAM or high bandwidth memory. It's got protocol acceleration. So hardware pipelines, either programmable or not, for doing uh, specific protocol accelerations. It's got security and support accelerators. A host interface, as I said, it can pretend to be a lot of things. And then it has um, uh, embedded networking elements. So it can act like a NIC. In some cases, it can act like a switch. Um, it can do advanced uh, networking functions. And if you say, well, I've got all these capabilities, what are they good for? Well, they're good in for a combination of different things. So you could do NVMe over fabric and storage offload. So now you look like an SEHBA++, uh, but with an IP SAN. You can optimize uh, solution level data flow processing. Uh, maybe GPU pooling is a good example of that. You could offload control plane, saving your x86 cores for business relevant work. And that fits in for both um, a hypervisor offload as well as kind of cluster wide uh, control plane functions. Security, telemetry, application specific computational offload. Um, so I can take advantage of regular expression matching. I can take advantage of specific containers doing offload. Uh, plug into standard Linux functions. Um, obviously, I could act as a get network gateway or even possibly an SD-WAN device. And I can do physical and virtual network packet forwarding. And then obviously, this can be a component in a computational storage uh, system. So when you take all of this together, um, you get an element that helps isolate your server from the rest of the world and couple your server to the rest of the world at the same time. 
So it provides both a boundary and a processing element. And if you look at where you could deploy these things, you could deploy them obviously as part of a server. I talked about that. You could also have a, an XP rich appliance where it's a, some, you know, essentially a, a server or a chassis that can install a bunch of XPUs and have some compute, general purpose compute. And then the third place you can deploy is a gateway. So you could put the XPU as a boundary between two pieces of network and have it do uh, interesting functions like uh, tunnel termination, uh, firewall, load balancing. So it effectively can become like a, a container network function uh, hosting platform is a general purpose thing. And uh, as I said, what my colleagues are going to do is go into more details on these various aspects and show how this fits into the wider world. So with that, Jay, take it away. Thank you, Joe. Um, good morning, everybody. So I have uh, three simple things. I have three three simple goals for my presentation. First, I want to explain what are the trends that drove the emergence of XPUs, DPUs, etc. Secondly, I want to tell you a little bit more about what are the specific workloads that DPUs and XPUs will really shine at. You know, just like you don't want, you know, if you take a GPU, you want it to run machine learning stuff, but you really don't want to run Oracle on it. And so picking the right workload to run uh, is very important. And so we'll talk about what are those workloads that DPUs and XPUs will shine at. And ultimately, my goal is to really convince you that future data centers are going to have DPUs, XPUs alongside CPUs and GPUs. That it's sort of a third class of processor. It has its role and it'll be complementary to the other big classes of processors that we have. So very simple goals. So with that, I'm gonna move forward. Let me begin by talking about two mega trends that we are seeing in data centers and data center infrastructure that primarily drove uh, the, the emergence of this class of processor. The first is a growth in what we are calling data-centric tasks. And by the way, this is the way I simplify and define what is the uh, XPU, DPU good for. It's for data-centric tasks. Um, and what is a data-centric task? It is where uh, you're doing you're handling high bandwidth streams, but you're multiplexing between many of these high bandwidth streams. So when you're doing networking, there's many, many millions of flows you're trying to handle. And you get one packet from one flow, you get another packet from another flow. And so you're doing multiplexing, you're task switching, and traditional general purpose processors are not very good at this kind of multiplexing where each packet, you don't have to do a lot of work. You might do a hundred instructions of work and then you have to switch. Uh, they're just not very good at it. Um, the, 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 the DPUs and the XPUs are optimized for these data centric tasks. There was a paper back in 2014 or 2015 by Google that measured stuff in their data center and said almost 33% of stuff that we're doing is data centric. And it's just low level infrastructure stuff. Uh, general purpose processors are not good at it. And that's really key to why these kind of processes have emerged. I think that was 33% then, it's probably closer to 50% now. And you want something that's really optimized for those kind of tasks. The second mega trend that uh, these kind of processing units are very important for is what I call cloudification. You know, everybody wants cloud-like infrastructure like the public cloud hyperscalers have. You want it on-prem, you want service providers want it, and so forth. And the way that you get the same kind of efficiency that the hyperscalers have is to efficiently disaggregate expensive resources like SSDs and GPUs. And the DPU slash XPU is really good 
at efficient disaggregation of resources because ultimately that's a networking problem and that's what it's really good at. So those are the two trends that drove the emergence of this class of processor. Now I wanna give you two, uh, I wanna give you examples of products. These are data centric products and that's why these, these kind of processors are going to be used inside uh, for these products. And there's sort of two classes of products that you see here. On the left are DPU, XPUs that enhance existing servers. So you take a general purpose server, might be a compute server, might be a storage server. And then these, uh, these processing units are typically in PCIe cards that plug into those servers and they enhance the capability of that existing server. Now, a lot of the discussion of XPUs is really focused on this class of product, the product on the left. But really there is a, as important is a class of product on the right, which are products that don't have general purpose processors and they're entirely built using DPU slash XPUs. And an example of that is, for example, a high performance storage server, a storage target that can be built entirely with this kind of processor. Similarly, uh, computational storage is another example. You know, computational storage is where instead of moving data to compute, you're moving the compute close to the data. And uh, while you can do that kind of computation close to the data using many different kinds of processors, um, the DPU slash XPU is an excellent way to do it. Uh, the third example is, for example, an SDN appliance where you've got packets coming in on the network, many connections, um, you know, with different kinds of overlay uh, technology applied to it, like the XLAN or NVGRE, and you have to unpack it, you have to do a lookup, you have to decide is this a new flow or part of an existing flow, then you have to convert it to a different kind of overlay and send it out on a different kind of port that the lookup told you where to go. Um, and again, you can build uh, these kind of appliances entirely using XPU slash DPU. So very important to remember, there's really two classes of products and both are important. The, the ones that enhance uh, existing servers and the ones that are completely standalone. Now, I wanna give you examples of both kinds. So this is an example of products that enhance a compute server. So for example, I can enhance the networking capability of a compute server by using uh, an XPU DPU. Uh, an example I've given here is a routing, which can be significantly enhanced. Uh, several cores of the existing server uh, are freed up to do other work like application work because the, um, the XPU DPU is doing that and you're improving performance at the same time. So what you're getting is you're getting offload and accelerate. Same with, there's a good security example in here. You wanna do a stateful firewall, you can do it entirely in a general purpose server, or you can do it in a general purpose server with an XPU. And so good example here, it saves 12 cores, improves performance. Same thing with storage uh, on the initiator, as an initiator um, and the card um, with the uh, XPU in it, can again offload and accelerate. And I got another example there. So all of these are cases where life gets better. You're, you're letting the general purpose server run more applications and you're improving the performance of the thing you're trying to improve. Now here's a second class of product. This is, the, this is a product that only uses a DPU or an XPU. There is no uh, general purpose processor in it. Typically, uh, so this is an example of a storage server or a storage target. Typically it's built uh, using the picture on the left. You have some sort of general purpose processor. You have a NIC to talk to the network. You might have some accelerators uh, that might be other cards to do compression, encryption and so forth. You have some PCIe logic, maybe PCIe switching. Um, as Joe showed on his chart, really, this is what an XPU is. It puts all of these things together into a chip. So the chip has general purpose cores. It has a network unit, which is, which is what the NIC is. It has connections to PCIe. 
It has these accelerators to do compression, encryption, erasure coding, whatever you want for storage. And so now you have a single chip kind of solution, except for the DRAM, which is outside. And of course, as you know, when you integrate, you get better reliability, better cost, uh, and so forth. Um, and there's an example in the bottom of the slide that says, look, if you, and, and this is using real examples of existing products that are built using a DPU in one case and built using an x86, um, a very high performance x86 server, the, the best that we know of. Uh, and you can see that if you look at the improvement factor, you can get significantly better on a bunch of metrics like performance, like power, uh, performance per watt, et cetera. So this is why uh, this is why this is a good use case for the use of this emerging type of processor. Now, um, I also want to talk a little bit about cloudification and efficient disaggregation. If you remember, I said, look, the best way to utilize expensive resources is to disaggregate them and put them into pools. So this picture, which is the way future next generation data centers are likely to be built, uh, does exactly that. So you'll see a pool of general purpose servers on the top left of the picture. You'll see a pool of GPUs on the top right of the picture. You see a pool of storage at the bottom of the picture. And they're all, of course, connected by standard IP networks. In this particular picture, I'm showing uh, that uh, the left CPU servers and the right GPU servers have um, cards that use an XPU slash DPU in them. Um, and then, of course, the storage can be entirely built using this new kind of processor. And so now I have these pools of resources, and now I can assign them dynamically based upon the workload. And that's what the Composer software on the top right is doing. It's basically, you can go to it and say, give me a server with four terabytes of SSD and three GPUs. And while there is no such physical server in the data center, it can dynamically create it. The four terabytes of SSD comes from the storage pool and the two GPUs comes from the GPU pool on the top right. And this is the this is where uh, most infrastructure companies are going. Um, you know, you can you can Google and see uh, you know all of the big players, uh, the Dells, the HPs, all talk about composable infrastructures in the future. The main point here for this talk is that um, XPUs, DPUs are very critical to efficiently disaggregating uh, because of its great networking capability, and that is key to this new kind of composable infrastructure. So here's my summary. You know, future data centers are increasingly going to use not just CPUs and GPUs, mm -hmm. but they're going to use XPUs. And uh, these will handle the data-centric tasks. There's more and more mm -hmm. data-centric tasks in data centers. This is what these will do. They will also efficiently disaggregate resources and in conjunction with composable software, they will help us create the data centers of the future. So hopefully I've convinced you that uh, there's, there's a bright future for these emerging class of processors. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Lior and he's gonna to talk to you about deployments. Thank you very much, Jay. Um, so I'm Lior uh, Kermush, uh, Neuralty CTO, and I, I want to discuss the XPU uh, deployment and solutions. So um, from deployment perspective, the XPUs are the foundation of uh, the composable infrastructure deployment. So what, 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 this is what we see here in the figure. Composable infrastructure um, is the current and future architecture horizon of data center and cloud deployment, basically allowing to disaggregate compute workloads over the network between the different types of infrastructure elements assembled in the most optimized and efficient way of deployment. So what do we see here? We have different components. They're aggregated for the infrastructure and therefore they're more efficient and user can take the right chunks of of, of it for their workload. And the key point here is the network that combines between them and the data that flows 
as the workload goes between the different elements for an efficient implementation. And the XPUs are the basis to put in this structure in the most efficient way so that you can get the workload spread out between these composable infrastructure resources. There are multiple options for disaggregation of resources over the network, as illustrated here, all relying on a smart data connection, a smart brain that creates the network disaggregation, the, the, the network connection and disaggregation, and provides the brains of transferring the data, partitioning the resources, and um, um, allowing the workloads um, to work in highest performance and taking use of the resources. So the basis for that, this connection is the XPU. And the XPU therefore provides an extremely efficient way to scale and to handle big data deployment. The XPU allows an application to get remote resources as if they were the server local resources without using any of the CPU application resources. It handles and offloads all the infrastructure data pattern management operation for this function and supports special offloads for functions like storage or accelerator resources. So again, it's like the, work, the, the key thing is to make the workload riot run as if it's local, as if it was running on the certain server and allowing us to gain all the benefits of composable infrastructure. Um, the diagram basically shows a composable data center architecture. On the left side, we can see the general compute, where we, we, where we will usually run the general purpose parts of the workload. Um, storage um, in the middle, and acceleration compute that basically uh, runs um, um, servers that have a lot of um, accelerators in them. Um, the XPU allows to break the workload efficiently between the different types of infrastructure so that the workload can run on its most optimized resource in each one of the parts and also timeshare and, con and the consumption between multiple clients so that the resource can be spread between multiple workloads and uh, therefore we get the resources in uh, full utilization. And all of that is, should be supported with cloud-ready orchestration and virtualization of the resources, things that the XPU must support in, in high efficiency and without involvement of software of, and CPU application. Um, so the sh figure shows multiple deployment options. We can see here on the left, the XPU as the front of the general purpose server, XPU as a front end of a headless storage, or a computational storage element. XPUs on the right side as connecting a complex server with accelerator executing execution capabilities, uh, with accelerator execution capabilities. And may maybe a standalone server uh, with an XPU as a headless front end for multiple acceleration en and storage engines, what we marked here as a NAPU. So an NAPU is a network um, um, addressable processing unit, and it's a workflow optimized hardware device that has one or more specialized processing unit, native network capability, streamlined hardware-based data path, cap cloud-ready capabilities of virtualization, uh, and managing resource abstraction layer and cell sufficiency to be a head end for um, acceleration or, or storage elements. So. That's, that's the standalone XPU, as we've discussed. Um, so I want to go and talk a little bit in more detail about the XPU solution. And I want to do that going over uh, what, I, what I call a unified block diagram of an XPU. Of course, the different flavors of XPU vary, vary in between their specific block diagrams or in between the use case, but I, I try to generalize the function. And, and basically, at the first and most, the XPU is a very complex system on a chip with a lot of CPUs inside that, with high processing capabilities. And it basically, from the interface perspective, connects to the network to provide the network interface. 
and to a host, application level CPU, and device, which can be a storage or accelerator interface. These can be over PCIe, or now we see emerging coherent protocols like CXL, SysX, or take your flavor of uh, different uh, peripheral protocols that exist. Um, the, the CPU um, basically is contains, as we mentioned, since it's involved in the data path operation, so it contains the heart of the server data path processing. And it's doing functions like that are very important for, um, and it offloads from the host very important networking functions. It's implementing a uh, virtual switch um, um, offloading, network processing uh, uh, functions, uh, provides elements like networking uh, quality of service. It's providing the whole SNIC uh, network interface card function. It provides usually a gateway. It provides capabilities of deep packet inspection. And all of that usually with high programmability, high performance programmability using like languages like P4. Um, the XPU also includes a handful of offload and acceleration capabilities, like storage acceleration um, and offload uh, security acceleration and compute acceleration function. The storage acceleration contains function like offloading uh, of NVMe or offloading of NVMe over fabric protocols, offloading of fiber channel, offloading of different multiple storage stacks. So we get storage in high performance remote storage in high performance as if the storage was local. The security uh, acceleration functions allow us to handle the server security elements like uh, handling crypto acceleration functions that run on hardware based. Functions like authentication, attestation, holding keys and tokens in the most secure way, very far from the user applications policy enforcement, policy security enforcement, firewall and server and server root of trust uh, functions. Um, the compute acceleration uh, here includes functions like uh, general purpose compute management, um, hypervising function, general purpose P4 programming uh, function, AI acceleration, database acceleration, uh, key value store uh, offloading, uh, and so on. So this is the general purpose function that exists and live in the basis of um, the server uh, da data processing function. Um, so what functions are the XPU implementing? It, so it's implementing us all the server offloading functions like server virtualization in high performance, all, all of that in high performance the host offloading uh, function of um, um, NIC function, storage function, and different stacks. Store, it could be a storage front end. It could be a bare metal virtual machine container management. It can do, it can do server, it can be a server root of trust function. It can handle multiple compute uh, offload functions that accelerate uh, 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 high compute uh, accelerators security offloading and data pro processing. So the XPU is an extremely effective way to scale and to handle big data. And we can see that in the diagram here, it, it basically um, um, allows an application to get remote resources uh, locally without involvement of the CPU. The path goes through the XPU network, the XPU uh, um, infra uh, uh, infrastructure, that connects between the servers and allow one server to use resources from another. And it handles all the infrastructure, data path and management operations for this function. So I want to summarize the key advantages of the XPU. The, the XPU provide an efficient host offloading. So again, we keep the compute cores dedicated for the application not for infrastructure and the path movement, not to handle, not, not for management, not for serving the application. The host is used for the application. 
also, and, it, and it's a separate point, in many cases, the CPU is just sold waiting for this data path processing, for data, for memory, for I.O. Not everything can be pipelined, and data processing latency is a critical thing. And this is, this is actually a key item that XPUs excel in. They provide very low latency of data access. And it's not just offloading the function, it's providing the data in the right time so that the CPU is not waiting for it. And sometimes it must wait. It provides all these functions in high performance, removing bottlenecks, accelerating key complex functions, providing all of that with quality of service, networking processing, firewall functions, and all of that it provides with high programmability, meaning programmability at performance with uh, the right programmability language, like P4. I, I view the XPUs as the joints of the composable infrastructure. It allows us to use the right accelerator at the right place in exactly the right portion for the right part of the workload. And it supports multiple types like uh, uh, of uh, um, functions, accelerating networking storage and providing access to compute accelerator. And it provides all with native virtualization and data center management. It's also providing and, and allowing us to have an isolated embedded controlling entity. And it's usually something that is very important in the server to have an isolated entity that is controlled and it's far from the um, user application. So it can't mess with it from uh, security aspects and SLA aspects and, and management aspects. So it's excellent for server management and security. It's excellent for bare metal management of servers, for VM management, of hypervising and providing root of trust. So I, I hope it's, it's now the, the messages of the importance of the XPUs and, and actually their architecture innovation in the data center. And uh, I, I think it's an important part that is introduced today that allows us to scale better um, with Moore's law and, and provide the data center to scale as a system through its architecture. So um, that's it from my side. Let me please hand over to John that will introduce the market landscape, please. Thank you, Lior. Hi, I'm John Kim. Let me talk about the market landscape for XPUs. So first of all, some analyst projections. Uh, so we see that Gartner has published a projection that by 2023, which is next year, one in three NICs will be a functional accelerator card or FAC. Uh, now, an FAC is not necessarily exactly the same as an XPU, but uh, most of the time there's a high overlap. So generally most of the FACs are XPUs and most of the XPUs are, are FACs. So that's uh, certainly one uh, sign that it's going to be an important part of the market. And Del Oro, a different analyst, has also publicly stated that the SmartNIC revenue will reach 1.6 billion US dollars worldwide uh, by 2026. And also that more, for hyperscalers, uh, cloud service providers, more than half of the servers shipped will include a SmartNIC. Now, again, a SmartNIC is not necessarily an XPU. And I think there, you could argue that there are many SmartNICs that are not XPUs. Uh, but I, again, believe that increasingly a vast majority of those SmartNICs going forward, a higher and higher percentage of the SmartNICs will be XPUs, uh, though not all of them. It's worthwhile pointing out that not all of the uh, XPUs are included in these forecasts because, uh, first of all, if you're a regular CPU, a tensor processing unit, a GPU, or uh, an APU, then uh, or a crypto card, it's, you may not be included in the SmartNIC forecast or the FAC, uh, and you, you, though you probably would be in the FAC forecast from Gartner. In addition, there are managed appliances and uh, Jay talked about some of these uh, managed appliances that could be storage appliances, security appliances, firewalls, gateways, load balancers, or other types of appliances which uh, use an XPU as the controller, and they may not be included in some of these analyst forecasts. 
So talk about who makes these XPUs and who sells them. So first of all, XPUs are available from several startups. Uh, and some of the startups make their own silicon and some of them create XPUs using silicon from larger vendors. Uh, and then there are some, of course, big vendors, which fall into the category of silicon vendors, which I've listed here. Uh, so there are several large ones who are working on uh, different types of XPUs. And then there are also some networking vendors. So for example, I think you, you could go to um, Cisco and probably get a SmartNIC or uh, an XPU at some point and Cisco would probably be building that with components from, uh, from one of the silicon vendors uh, or possibly with their own silicon. Uh, so you can get it from the networking vendors or you could go to Aruba today, and, which is part of HPE uh, on the networking side and they may offer a switch which includes an XPU inside. Those are just two examples. And then also the cloud service providers or CSPs they often are designing their own XPUs and they may or may not be building it. I think what we see most often, um, of course, a famous example is AWS. They acquired an XPU vendor or a chip vendor and then now they build their own XPUs. And there are other large, large cloud service providers that design and, or, and have con built under contract XPUs uh, built on their specifications, but perhaps using silicon from one of these startups or one of the big silicon vendors. Now, who sells the XPUs? So, of course, the XPU vendors tend typically offer these for sale directly. And then the uh, infrastructure OEMs and ODMs tend to include offer them. So these could be server vendors, the big server OEMs and ODMs, or storage OEMs, firewall OEMs, uh, other, and other appliance makers can sell these as part of their embedded in their offering. You have the resellers or the, and the channel and the system integrators who can sell these. And then the cloud service providers are in many cases offering XPU services, but indirectly. They don't let you buy the card from them, but they sell you services that are enhanced or accelerated or uh, have offloads that are built on XPUs. So in some cases, when you're using cloud services, you may be getting the benefit of an XPU, uh, even though you don't physically buy the card from them. So part of the landscape is how do we program XPUs? Uh, how do we make design them, make them do what we want? So most of them support various open interfaces for specific functions. So an XPU might, for example, support DPDK to program uh, the networking or the data path of, and, and that could be for general networking or for, um, or for virtual, supporting virtualization uh, or for supporting secu some security use cases that might be programmed through DPDK. And many of the XPU vendors support that. SPDK lets you program a storage IO, a storage throughput in a certain way. So some of the XPUs support that. Uh, OVS or OVN, Open vSwitch and Open Virtual Networking are another way that's a, a common and you know, inter open interface that many XPUs support as a way to offload, uh, as a way to offload some of the switching, the packet switching from the hypervisor to the XPU. Um, they often also support things like NVMe over fabrics and then P4. P4 is a language for programming packet flows uh, and several XPUs also support that as well. So what we see is that individual functions within the XPUs are often supported by open interfaces. In addition, most of the vendors offer their own vendor specific development platforms and SDKs or APIs. In some cases, it's because they may support functions that are only supported by that particular model or that particular vendor. So obviously if, you, if you're a vendor and you offer an XPU function that nobody else supports, there's not gonna be an open source or, or common interface for that you're going to offer your own. Uh, or you may, some vendors may support both. They say, here, you can, here's a function on our card, our XP, you can program it with either an open source interface or with our own uh, developer kit to maybe get better performance or easier programming. In terms of, uh, there is an initiative to develop open platforms or software developer kits. So for example, the OPI project, which includes, uh, I think, is it folding in IPDK? That is a project which is kicking off and its intention is to offer a common interface to program XPUs, uh, IPUs and DPUs and so forth. Uh, and I think we might see that uh, IPDK is an initiative which has been championed by one vendor, but uh, it's possible this interface will become common or supported by many. So DPDK is, a, is an example of that. It's something which just started off by one vendor, but it became open and is now supported by most uh, SmartNIC and XPU vendors. 
So IPDK may be able to follow that same path. Uh, Dash is another way to program manageability for, uh, for XPUs. And then in terms of who's programming, who's doing the development, so you have a wide variety. Of course, the, in some cases, the vendors do it, and they'll do it for the customers or sell the um, applications with the XPUs. The end users, especially larger ones, are often programming it themselves. The software vendors or ISVs may be writing, using programming XPUs to integrate their applications, like, say, a firewall application or a routing or load balancing application could be integrated by a software vendor with XPUs. Uh, and then if the infrastructure OEMs, like a server vendor sells an XPU, they might also offer the programming or applications to go with it. And then of course, system integrators and then the cloud service providers do that as well. So my last slide, let's talk about uh, the trade-offs and considerations. So of course, the easy answer from a vendor side is we could just say, hey, everyone should just put an XPU in every single server. And that's a great story, but it may not actually be true. It may not make sense to put one in every server because an XPU gives you, uh, as, as, um, as uh, Lior was saying, it gives you better efficiency and better performance and higher, better TCO if you're running workloads that can be offloaded more efficiently or perform more efficiently by the XPU than by the CPU. Uh, and so if you have the right networking workload, security, management, storage, that can be offloaded more efficiently by the XPU, then definitely running it can give you better performance, more efficiency, lower TCO, better management, and so forth. But if you're running gene just generic applications, which might be better suited to run on a CPU, a regular CPU in the first place, then adding an XPU may not give you those benefits. Uh, so clearly, again, you know, the benefits, if you have part of the workload or infrastructure tasks that are better suited to an XPU, you definitely have a benefit from putting it in, and you should be putting it into those servers. Uh, and get that better efficiency, TCO, et cetera. And you may get better security as well. But on the other hand, you know, XPUs are not free. They do increase the cost of the server. They increase the power consumption you know, on an on a absolute basis. Uh, so if you're not getting enough benefit or offloads or buying back enough CPU cores, then it doesn't make sense to put it in the server. Uh, and the other thing is that the XPUs need to be programmed. So if you're a very large company or cloud service provider, uh, I think it definitely makes sense. Whatever effort you take to program the XPUs will be returned uh, multiple times in terms of pay, payback or benefits. Uh, but if you're a small company, a small enterprise, small organization, you have to consider it may be, you know, it may be a big effort, relatively speaking, to program that XPU. So again, you may be able to get pre-programmed or pre-built applications from the ISV or system integrator or the uh, server vendor or so forth. So that's a consideration of what is the amount of effort needed to program that XPU. Uh, and the other thing is today, there is no one standard interface for all the XPUs. There are individual uh, APIs or, pro or developer kits that work across many XPUs, but there's no one interface yet that can support, let you write once and run across many different types of XPUs. All right, that's the end of my section. Let me hand it back to Alex. Thank you very much indeed. That's uh, really an excellent and interesting uh, presentation. Um, we actually have a few uh, minutes to before the end of the presentation. So what I intend doing is pointing out that we, 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 we've had a fairly technical presentation. And as a consequence, we seem to have got a fairly technical set of questions. Four of them, either from the same person interested in CXL or from four different people interested in CXL, Computer Express Link. So I'm going to try and bundle the question up into one and see if we can get one of you guys to, 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 to address this. Um, the, the, the question is, or the questions are primarily around what role CXL will play in these disaggregated data centers. Um, and I suspect that, uh, you know, there's this thing about market adoption of CXL. Isn't that required to support XPUs? And, you know, how does CXL impact uh, communication with other components, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Would anyone like to try and address that? Uh, um, sure, I can. Yeah, yeah, I can. Okay, go ahead, Jay. Who's, who's the I? That's the first thing. <laughs> you don't even recognize my voice. This is Jay. <laughs> oh, okay, Jay. I, I recognize your voice. <laughs> Yeah, you know, here's the way I see it. I, I, I feel uh, the two are orthogonal. I mean, I don't see that the rise or otherwise of CXL having implications on the marketability 
and revenue that XPUs will bring. You know, XPUs today support PCIe. You know, the next generation will support Gen 4s and Gen 5s and CXL. So as the as that technology evolves, the XPU technology will evolve with it. And you know, there's lots and lots of servers in the world today that are PCIe Gen 4 and lots of XPUs <laughs> that support that. And I think there will be huge market for that. So I think the two are orthogonal to me. Now, on the other question that was asked, which is about, do I need it for disaggregation? Here's the way that I would answer that question. I think that uh, it really depends on the resource that you're trying to disaggregate. You know, uh, we uh, there may be certain resources. Memory is a really good example of that, where CXL will have a role, but it's already been proven that for things like SSDs, where you know the latency of the SSD uh, is you know 50 microseconds or 100 microseconds, uh, disaggregating uh, using XPUs and using standard networking is, is good enough. The same has been shown for GPUs. So it sort of depends on where you're going. I think people will try to uh, disaggregate um, even memory using using networking because you know Ethernet has been around forever, and people have always found that assuming Ethernet will be around forever is generally a good idea. There will also be uh, a lot of use of CXL, um, but I think uh, to me anyway, the the answer number one is I feel they're 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 orthogonal. I I don't see the success of one impacting the success of the other. Okay, I'll let other people on so, the panel add. To yeah. That. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to what uh, Jay said. So first, first of all, I agree with what you said. Um, I'll, I'll add maybe a technical aspect. So I, I see CXL as a, an important involvement in the server architecture. And, and indeed, it's orthogonal, and, but it's complementary. And in my diagram on the solution, I showed the interface, and it's appearing in the host and device interface. And it basically allows the XPU to, to enhance the couple coupling to the CPU. And it allows it to, make, to be more efficient in tasks like uh, interfacing memory pooling or when there's coherent tasks that uh, are offloaded. And um, these are maybe the use cases. So it can enhance the XPU um, um, capabilities when attached to the host or an, when attached to devices. So I think on technical perspective, um, we will see complementary and uh, building in building forces between the technologies, but I agree with what Jay said that from commercial perspective, the business is not is not related and XPUs are on their own domain. Okay. Joe, any comments? Uh, yeah. So everything that Jay and Lior said is um, very good. The only other piece is that uh, an XPU could expose, you know, the CXL memory interface uh, to the other components uh, on the bus. So that would be the only other thing is that it could act like a, a memory, you know, a memory device as well. Because remember, the point of these XPUs is that they can be multi-personality with hardware offloads and a variety of components. And they come in a number of different shapes and sizes, which kind of bleeds into another set of questions around the historical evolution of offloaded cards um, and were those XPUs. And the way I view this is they were all proto XPUs, but they didn't have the combination of components that we've all been describing here to then make them a full blown XPU at the efficiency level that you can get with this combination of components for data flow processing. So yeah, there were tow uh, cards before, you know, TCP offload engines. There were iSCSI offloads. There were, uh, you know, fiber channel HBAs have an aspect, but the DPU can do all of that and more, or the XPU can, which makes, puts it in a class by itself, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look way back in time, there were companies proposing, hey, combine a whole bunch of functions together on a card like this, but the technology, the density of silicon you needed and the power efficiency wasn't there until very recently. 
Yeah, okay. so I, I think, Joel, that was a great answer. I'd like to elaborate on, the, on that answer with respect to these offload engines, the toes that Adaptec made many years ago and so on. Uh, and, I, and I agree with you, these were all precursors to where we are today. But, you know, I think to me, the fundamental difference is that an XPU is a programmable processor. It just happens to have embedded on the chip, in addition to the programmable cores, it has accelerators, it has a network unit, and it has connectivity to PCIe. So you can use the XPU to do many things. And, and toes are things you could do with an XPU but it's a very small subset of the kinds of things you can do with an XPU. So you can, on the same card, you can do storage things like toes, but you're also doing networking offloads. You're doing stateful firewall. You know, so there's a lot of things you can do on the card. So in some sense, comparing it to a toe is very limiting because the XPU is A, programmable, and B, capable of multiple functions all running at the same time on the same card. So. So what you can do with it because it's programmable and is in some ways unlimited. However, as I think all of us have made clear that you don't want to do the wrong thing on it. Just like you don't want to run Oracle on a GPU, you don't want to do anything, but it is capable of anything. And I think just picking the right things and toe is a good example of something it would be good at. So that, that's where I'll, I'll stop there. I'm going to give John the last 30 seconds, John. John, have you got anything to add? Uh, actually, I don't. So I would say if you have time, go on to another question. I think that's about it for the questions. We're close to the hour anyway. I'd like to thank everybody for coming along today. Um, this is a series. We've got another webcast. There's a, a QR code up there for the webcast. Uh, XPU Accelerator Offload Functions on June the 29th. It's a little bit away, but uh, uh, hopefully you'll be able to attend with us. Uh, the link is there as well. Thank you, everybody, for your contributions today. They're much appreciated. So after this webcast, please rate the webcast on the way out. Give us your feedback. Uh, let us know what you think of this. Remember the scale, one to five. One, goodness, I should have been doing something else. You probably aren't around now, by the way, if you thought it was a one. But certainly, we'd love fives, as long as you think they're justified. And give us some commentary. We're always looking for it. Secondly, you've got a copy of the slides. If you don't get it now, you can get it from the SMEA Educational Library. Uh, the Q&A from this webcast, we'll take all the questions and we'll uh, answer the ones that we didn't answer as well. And we'll post them on our blog at SNEA, nsfblog.org. And you can follow us on our own particular SNEA uh, uh, Twitter handle on SNEA NSF. In the meanwhile, Joe, Jay, Leo, John, thank you very much for entertaining us today. Thanks to the audience for attending. and. Let's meet again. Thank you. <laughs>